Ken received his PhD at UC Santa Barbara, working under Lars Bilston. Uh, he then uh, became an Einstein Fellow, uh, moved to Berkeley, uh, and has continued on at Berkeley as an assistant researcher. Uh, Ken is an expert on pretty much everything 1A, so... Uh, probably not quite true, exaggerate. But, uh, <laughs> you know, that, that's okay, we like to exaggerate for our guests. Uh, so, uh, Ken will be talking today about a paradigm shift for type 1A supernova progenitors. Thanks. Um, I was warned that maybe the title was a little too grandiose, but uh, it is sort of true. There has been kind of a revolution in what the Type 1A supernova community, um, our assumptions about what the progenitors of these supernovae are. Uh, as of maybe 10 years ago, most of the community had a certain scenario in mind. Um, and I would say within the last 10 years, now, maybe not most, but I'd say a order of 50% of the community has the exact opposite opinion now, that they think that that scenario is not responsible for the bulk of type 1A supernovae. So really it's an interesting uh, field to be in because it's, it's changed so drastically in just a, a relatively short time span. Um, so there is kind of a paradigm shift. Now of course any talk about type 1A supernovae, one is obligated to mention that, as we all know, they are very important for our understanding of cosmology and the evolution of the universe itself. Um, due to their function as standard candles, uh, a little more precisely, they're not standard candles, right? They're standard eyeball candles. There's this relationship between their peak luminosities uh, and the, the, their light curve shape, which you can standardize, uh, leading to normalized light curves that relatively, you know, mostly all look the same. So they give us cosmological distance indicators, allows us to make measurements of, uh, for example, uh, omega lambda and omega matter. Um, they're also important uh, at a slightly smaller scale for chemical enrichment, in particular uh, iron group elements, things like iron and cobalt and nickel. Um, at the present age of the universe, something like 50% of our iron group elements, maybe a little more, have come from type 1A supernovae. They're not as important as core collapse supernovae for uh, enrichment of some other elements, but they are important for iron group elements. Yet given their importance in, in several other fields, um, we actually don't know what they are. So there have been claims in the literature uh, that we have identified the progenitors of type 1A supernovae, and you may discover a uh, little trend here of the certain journals that might be uh, <laughs> uh, claiming these titles. But you know, in spite of these claims, we do not know what the progenitors of regular, normal type 1A supernovae. So we do know, you know, for example, that there's likely a certain kind of a supernova progenitor for a funny kind of type 1A supernova. Okay. It doesn't say it's funny. Um, likewise, there was a detection that's very related to a possible companion in a funny type 1A supernova, but again, the title does not say so. So for the bulk of normal type 1A supernovae, the 90% of regular type 1A supernovae, there's never been a detection of any progenitor. So uh, the rest of this talk, I'm going to try to motivate what the possible progenitors are and what we do and do not know um, about the progenitor system. Okay, so let me start off with the very basics of what we do know about type 1A supernovae. So we have extensive measurements of their light curves and spectra. The light curves do something where they peak in roughly a few weeks and then fall within a few weeks. And that time scale already tells us something useful. It tells us roughly the amount of mass that's in the ejecta of these supernovae. Right? The photons have to get through the expanding supernova ejecta uh, to you know, rise to peak and then fall. And so the time scale of a few weeks tells us that roughly there's something like a solar mass worth of ejecta in type 1A supernovae. And that's different from, say, a core collapse type 2P supernova, where the duration lasts a lot longer because there's a lot more ejecta mass. In type 1A supernovae, there's not a lot of ejecta mass. And so we know they're not from the explosions of very massive stars. There's something roughly uh, so the mass of the sun that's exploding. <coughs> their spectra are also uh, obviously useful indicators of their uh, nature. Um, the most important things are the presence of, you know, the hallmarks of type 1A supernovae are the presence of strong intermediate mass elements, things like silicon and calcium, as well as iron group elements, things like iron and cobalt and nickel. So that's what's seen in their spectra. Whatever's exploding, at, you know, darn well better produce those kinds of elements. They're also notable for what they don't show. They're type 1A, so they're not showing any hydrogen, they're not showing any helium. So they're the explosions of some sort of evolved star. Okay. Um, and sorry, I also should mention that that's consistent with their light curves just being powered by the radioactive decay of nickel. So they're producing iron intermediate mass elements, iron group elements such as nickel, and that's consistent with their decays. Another important fact is where they're found. So they're found in both spirals and ellipticals. Okay. 
And so whatever's producing them has to exist at early stellar ages, but also has to last for a long time as well. So that's another you know, obvious reason why they can't be massive stars, because all the massive stars are gone in you know, 10 giga years. That's also fairly common. Um, so something like for every thousand solar masses that are formed in, in a starburst, you get roughly one, one and a half uh, type 1a supernovae. And to give you a sense of how many that really is, um, white dwarfs are very common stellar endpoints, right? Roughly 1% of all white dwarfs formed in the universe have to go off as type 1a supernovae. Um, sorry, I just skipped the punchline. The simplest model, given the previous slide and these stellar ages, is that there's some sort of explosion of a carbon oxygen white dwarf. So to give you a sense, something like 1% of all white dwarfs then have to go off this type 1a supernova. OK, now white dwarfs are obviously, we all know, very stable on, on their own. The sun's going to become a white dwarf, and the sun will just cool off uh, and become, you know, for the, for the rest of the aging universe, nothing's going to happen to it, right? They're very stable. So the most common thing to assume is that you have some sort of binary star, uh, some sort of companion star that sets off the white dwarf and causes it to explode. Almost, I would say, almost the entire Type 1a supernova community is okay with that statement, so that you have a binary companion, or you know, some sort of companion that causes uh, the explosion of the white dwarf. But here, no one, after that, no one knows the next part of the sentence. We don't know what the companion is. Historically, people have discussed, I would say, two main scenarios. Okay? You often hear this single degenerate scenario, and that's a scenario where the companion is a non-degenerate hydrogen-rich star. And then I'll tell you how that then proceeds to a Type 1a supernova. The other main scenario that historically people talked about was the double degenerate scenario. And that's where it's two degenerate stars, two white dwarfs. And in the 80s, uh, some of the 90s, people also talked less, but talked somewhat about the double detonation scenario, where helium, a uh, helium-rich star was the companion, and that helium mass transfer triggered the type 1a supernova. However, since the 80s and I guess late 70s, when these scenarios were first envisioned, things have gotten a lot more complicated. Things have started to you know, mix and match the various uh, companion stars and how explosions were triggered. So no, I can no longer draw a nice cartoon. I have to make this ugly table that shows you the, you know, the landscape, the breadth of the various Type 1a supernova progenitor scenarios that are out there. So the historic, um, so the way this table is set up is how, what the companion is and how mass is transferred from that companion onto the white dwarf. And on the, in, in the columns, it's being shown how the explosion proceeds. And I'll describe in words in the next few slides uh, a little more. But just to say that historically that single degenerate scenario lives in this box, okay, but there are other kinds of explosion mechanisms with the same companion. For example, you can get a helium explosion in this system and it could go off as a double detonation. Historically that was actually one of the first double detonation scenarios. Okay, you can get a double detonation in a helium star system. You can also get a single degenerate kind of explosion in a helium star system. Okay, so the things are getting really complicated. Uh, in, an, I would say, an annoying way. Um, what I'm going to focus on in this talk are the historical single degenerate scenario, which lives in this box, and this double degenerate scenario, two white dwarfs uh, living in this box. Okay, and I'm then uh, going to try to convince you that these don't work, and these historical scenarios don't work, or at least I find it hard to believe that they're going to work as we currently understand them. Uh, and I'll motivate why I think that these boxes actually are very promising. Two white dwarfs that undergo a double detonation. Uh, I should mention that there are still many other things that I won't have time to talk about today. Um, so Bob and his student have worked on the mergers of two white dwarfs that undergo a certain instability during their evolution that leads to a direct carbon ignition. Um, so people have talked in recent years about so the possibility you can directly collide two white dwarfs via a COSI interaction with a third body. Um, so there are a bunch of other scenarios that I'm not going to talk about at all in this book, just for the sake of time. Okay. So historically, this was the scenario that most people believed in. Most people up until, I'd say, the late 2000s felt in their hearts that this was the way to go and you know, devoted most of their research energy into. So this is a scenario where you, uh, through a phase of common envelope evolution, end up with a white dwarf and a hydrogen-rich main sequence, or a red giant, or an asymptotic giant branch star. And as the, that star evolved, it overflows its Roche lobe and starts to dump matter through an accretion disk onto the white dwarf. For the right set of circumstances, the hydrogen-rich accretion can then perhaps stay on the white dwarf, grow the white dwarf mass up towards the change of sacral mass, as the white dwarf approaches the change of sacred mass, the density at the center gets very high, 
the, the wave functions of the nuclei can start to overlap. And you can get a kind of uh, nuclear burning called pycnonuclear burning, not thermonuclear, but pycnonuclear because it's driven by density. And that kind of burning will then lead to a convective carbon core that eventually transitions into some sort of explosion via um, a deflagration or a detonation. Now, what do I mean by a deflagration or detonation? Um, so this is a movie I'm going to show for terrestrial combustion, showing a terrestrial deflagration and a terrestrial detonation. The difference between the two is that a deflagration is subsonic, so it's moving slower than the speed of sound. There's time for sound waves to move ahead of the flame front and perturb material. So deflagrations turn, tend to be quite, uh, for the given parameter space, tend to be quite wrinkled, very you know, convoluted, very complex. Whereas detonations are supersonic, they're moving faster than sound, the upstream fuel has no time to respond, so they tend to be very smooth, quite ordered. Um, in this movie, I'm going to show a terrestrial simulation of, uh, I think, to methane burning in the air. It starts out as a deflagration. Right? It's subsonic, it's very wrinkled, um, it's very complex, it's propagating down this tube. It continues to do so for a while, so I'll just skip ahead. And in this cartoon, or sorry, it's a full on simulation, um, it actually, you see the mode change from a deflagration. Further from a deflagration into a detonation, right? right? So it triggers a very different mode of burning. And that actually turns out to be very important for Type 1A supernovae. Uh, they require a deflagration to detonation transition in this scenario. On Earth, uh, even though the movie made it seem like it happens, on Earth in unconfined explosions, you never see this. Okay? So on Earth, for whatever reason, deflagrations don't turn into detonations on their own. It does happen, but when it does happen, there's some sort of a boundary effect. It, you know, the, the flame hits a wall or something, and that triggers a, a transition. Uh, in the movie, it happened, but actually in terrestrial combustion, it, it doesn't tend to happen. Okay. So in the singlogenic scenario, you start core convection as you approach the change of sacred mass. At some point in that core, some hot spot goes off, and you start this flame, this deflagration. And in this simulation, the deflagration is going out uh, into the star, and at some point, uh, motivated by physics, but at some point, these modelers have turned on a detonation. Okay, so they've inserted a deflagration to detonation transition. How do you do that? Um, I don't do it. <laughs> so how did they? So they uh, they invoke some physics. They talk about um, as this deflagration is going out, the conditions are such that there's a lot of mixing of fuel and ash, and so as, yeah, fuel and ash, and so the conditions are ripe for a detonation. But really, what they're doing is they they kick it. Um, actually, sorry, they're using tables, so they just change to a different kind of table lookup where instead of propagating this flame front forward as a subsonic deflagration, they are now using a different table and that table is propagating as a detonation. So they're just changing how fast the flame front is moving out and what it's burning to. So it's the same code, but it just calls a different subroutine. That's right, that's right. Okay. Yeah. So this is the group, uh, at the time they were at um, the Max Planck Institute in Germany, um, but they were one of the main groups that was doing these kinds of simulations, they, have to, they had to put in that transition to a detonation. If they didn't, then the explosion didn't look quite like a 1A. Okay, so that was key. There's another way to do it. Okay, and this was group, uh, work led by a group at uh, the Flash Center in Chicago, um, in which Bob was a member at the time. In this uh, scenario, there was not an inserted detonation transition. So here, the deflagration bubble is bursting out of the white dwarf. And they continued to follow it, and as it came around to the other side, the convergence of those deflagration plumes caused the self-initiation of a detonation. Okay, so this is called a gravitationally confined detonation. Um, the idea being that you know, the confinement of these deflagration ashes caused this detonation to, to arise. But again, without that transition, if there's only a deflagration, it does not look like a 1A. You need some sort of transition to a detonation to make it look like a 1A in this scenario. So if you pass these things through radio transfer, what do they look like? So this is what's called a Phillips relation. If you're not familiar with it, this is the peak magnitude of the luminosity, the peak magnitude of the type 1A supernova, and how fast it declines from that peak. Um, the 15 is 15 days after peak, what is the magnitude difference? Okay, so brighter and faster decline rate. Um, this band is roughly where observations lie, more or less. And this bunch of data points is different uh, simulations, different viewing angles of different simulations in this scenario, with this Chandrasekhar mass deflagration to detonation transition scenario. You can see the, you know, the, op the observations reasonably match with the model predictions, sort of, right? There is a general trend 
bit-ish, but there's quite a large spread in the models. Um, I would say that's not a perfect fit. I think you'd all agree with me. Uh, but it's, it's reasonable. And so, you know, this was deemed a, a, a good sign, right? This is, they were on the right track with this scenario. If it's not perfect, it's not perfect. Sorry, what is being changed in the models to give you the relation? Yeah, um, so I'd have to look back at paper to make 100% sure, but um, some of these sequences are different viewing angles. So there is a lot of asymmetry in this kind of explosion. So if you look at a certain viewing angle, it might look different than a different viewing angle. Uh, the other thing that's being changed, and I think that's responsible for the, for the most of the, the uh, range, is how many ignition kernels, how many deflagration hotspots were set off at the center of the white dwarf. So that's it was a free parameter in this kind of simulation. Uh, if they went with one deflagration kernel, that gives a different kind of explosion than if they started the deflagration at a bunch of different spots at once. So the mass is the white dwarf always? They're all near Chandrasekhar. That's right. So this had some reasonable successes. Um, and that's why people, I think, were devoting a lot of energy into them. But all along, there had been issues. Okay? And the main one, at least in my mind, this problem of getting a white dwarf to the Chandrasekhar mass to begin with. Right? That's definitely the basis of the scenario. You have to be able to grow a white dwarf to the Chandrasekhar mass. And this is a problem that had been known since the 80s. Um, I did a project in grad school to basically confirm it, but uh, this plot kind of summarizes the problem. The problem is that for a given accretion rate, so a given white dwarf mass, there's only a small parameter space where you can actually put hydrogen on a white dwarf and keep it there. If you do it at too low an accretion rate, you give rise to what are called novae, classical or recurrent novae, and they eject the hydrogen. So the hydrogen, when it burns, it burns in an unstable fashion, and it gets ejected out of the system. So you don't keep the hydrogen. Conversely, if you go to a very high accretion rate, too high, then the white dwarf can't burn the, the fuel, can't burn the hydrogen fast enough to keep up with what's being accreted. You also lead to a very extended configuration and mass loss. So if you want to grow a white dwarf up to the change sacred mass, you have to live in this parameter space. Uh, and there just aren't a lot of systems that do that. Right? They're relatively rarer. Furthermore, that's just to burn the hydrogen fuel into helium fuel. Helium fuel, at some point, will also ignite, uh, <coughs> will also start to do triple alpha or what have you. And that ignition is also unstable. So even if you live in this parameter space where the hydrogen is fusing to helium and staying on the white dwarf, at some point, when you accumulate a large enough helium layer, that helium then gets set off. That is always unstable for in this parameter space. So when the helium gets set off, it also leads to radius expansion and mass loss. And so, really, it's hard to envision any system that actually is able to keep the hydrogen and keep the helium. Right? So it was very hard to imagine growing a white dwarf, you know, starting at, say, 0.8 or 1 solar masses, and actually give it a, you know, an evolutionary scenario that allowed it to grow to 1.35 or 1.4 solar masses. Right, so the actual basis of this scenario had a big problem. So can I ask you how fast this is? So I imagine this one E spherical kind of mm -hmm. calculation. So right. you add it, you transform mass, it's on the equator. Right, you know, so much where you this... can save this thing. Yeah. If this is people, robust, you could... Yeah, people definitely tried things like that. that um, help? Where the nuclear burning is taking place is at a deep enough layer that you know, centrifugal support, for example, yes, shouldn't matter. It, it's basically spherically symmetric. You can perhaps argue that you're maintaining maximal rotation, um, but the arguments for the, the transport of angular momentum via viscous stresses or via baroclinic instability, you know, magnetic stresses, all would say that there should be no differential rotation at the location of burning. So it's, it, you know, unless you invoke pretty extreme angular momentum transport schemes, um, well, it, it seems very hard to be very fast, right? Because the, the outer material should be, um, but it should then transfer the angular momentum very rapidly throughout the white dwarf core. Right. So that's good for the thing. It's, it's, it's bad. I mean, it's basically spherically symmetric. Then the, ro the rotation rate at the base of this layer is it should be very low. It should not be competing much with just gravity and thermal pressure support. But but that is. I mean, that is the way, the main way that people have tried to wiggle out of this is invoke questions about rotation and what that actually does to this scenario. Okay, so that's from a theoretical standpoint. Um, oh, sorry. As a result of that difficulty of growing a white dwarf to the Chandra Sacra mass, when you predict the type 1a rates from this scenario, it does not match observations. 
So this plot is what's called the delay time distribution. It's essentially, so it's the 1A rate as a function of the time from a starburst of formation. So it's the Green's function response to a delta function of star, you know, star formation at time of zero. These points are the observations. Um, this, that, this solid black line and dashed lines are work from uh, Orr and Danny Maus, also observations. These other colored lines are predictions from population synthesis calculations in this scenario. So even, you know, most of them, you can see most of them are orders of magnitude lower. Um, even the most extreme ones, the ones that I, you know, I'm on record, I guess, um, but I guess I would say this to the people as well. I think that the assumption, I'm going to say very politically, you know, uh, the assumptions are quite extreme, and I'm not sure that they are fully based in physical reality. Um, even the most extreme <laughs> scenarios, even if they do match, uh, at early times, everyone has problems at a few giga years, especially out to 10 giga years, because the donor stars, these main sequence or red giant stars, they don't exist anymore at that age. They've all evolved up the main sequence. Right? So at these very late times, all of these scenarios have an issue because the donors don't exist anymore. And most of them have a problem at all times, at least, um, by several orders of magnitude. Um, so, uh, let's see, so I'm at 20, okay. Um, I'll skip that one. Okay, so that's from a theoretical point. Uh, there is also uh, plenty of observational constraints against this scenario. So work by Dan Kaysen in 2010, he pointed out that this companion, this main sequence or red giant companion, will still be there when the supernova goes off. The supernova will hit it, and that counts, you know, it, it hits the companion, but the companion is also hitting the ejecta. It's injecting energy into the ejecta. So there's this cone of excess shock-heated ejecta that will give excess light to the type 1a supernova light curve, especially at early times. So this is the predicted contribution of that excess emission at early times. This is day since explosion, magnitude of the light curve. This is what a regular type 1a would look like. If you had a red giant in the way, it would contribute a bunch of excess emission at early times. For smaller main sequence stars, the contribution is less, but still possibly detectable. In the red giant case, it's so detectable, it's quite easily ruled out. Okay, so you can go to a bunch of type 1 light curves, look for this kind of excess emission, and just never see it. So red giants, I would say, are pretty much ruled out as type 1a supernova progenitors because of this, this argument. Now, the lower mass main sequence stars, it's hard to rule them out. Um, there's less of a contribution, and you can also say that you know, we're just unfavorably looking from here, say, and so we just don't see into this hot cone. Okay, but once you start getting enough, and once you start getting enough of them at very early times, you can also start to place constraints even on these low mass main sequence companions. Um, if the red giant is not seen in 90% of light curves, does that mean that they were seen in 10%? No, sorry, I mean, because of this viewing angle effect, you can say that, you know, yeah, maybe in 10% of the time we were from the back. Uh, it's just never seen. It's never seen, but you can't say it's always, it means that they're never there. It's just that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, Ken? So there is some evidence that some 1As have shown interaction with Jupiter, either those are weirdos. That's right, so that one science paper um, was a, it turned into a funny looking type 1a supernova. So that's a very small, small subclass. It's a, yeah, it's a 1ax. So uh, well, the, so PTF 11kx, so this was the one with the symbiotic nova progenitor. That one turned into a 1a plus CSM. Right, so 1a interactor. But that's a very small percentage. That's not normal type 1a supernova. So red giants have a big contribution. You can easily rule them out for most light curves. If you have a very well sampled early time light curve, you can rule out main sequence stars. 2011 FE was an example of this. It went off very, very nearby. And we had a serendipitous, um, you know, very early light, light curve measurements. So this is magnitude versus days. Uh, these are the measurements. And there was also a, uh, an upper limit, a uh, serendipitous upper limit. Okay. So the 1A light curve looks something like this. These blue lines are the contribution if you had a companion at a certain radius away. So say a main sequence star roughly like the sun, okay, it would contribute excess emission to the light curve that looked like this, and that's quite easily ruled out. Right? So this data point here rules out this as well as higher mass main sequence stars. So for 11 FE, 2011 FE, which is a very, very normal type 1A supernova, for that one case, we can easily rule out, not easily, sorry, we can uh, strongly rule out main sequence companions. 
And there really is no non-degenerate companion that would fit within that, that observation. Okay. 20LBFE, again, is only one case, but it was a very normal type 1A supernova. Um, in, re in the intervening years, people have started to be able to uh, have some more observations of other type 1A supernovae, not quite as good as this one, but uh, at least ruling out you know, several solar mass main sequence stars. So unless nature played a cruel trick on us, it really does look like main sequence and red giant companions, for whatever reason, they're just not there anymore at the time of, at the, time of the explosion. Okay. There are other observational constraints that I, I don't have time to get into, um, but I want to start laying out why, you know, start accumulating evidence for uh, what I think are, is the answer for type 1A supernova progenitors. So these, this standard single agenda scenario, again, the main one that most people believed in up until 10 years ago, has all these issues, okay? Does it actually explode? Well, if you can get a white dwarf to the change of mass, it will actually, it should do something. It should convect, and that convection will lead to a deflagration. Okay, so that's pretty certain. Uh, it's not clear, though, that you transition to a detonation and actually get a 1A supernova. So you might only have the deflagration. Uh, observationally, there's a whole ton of constraints, right? This fact that we don't see the shock interaction. I didn't get into it, but you expect to strip off some of the material from this companion, which you should see in the spectrum. And we never see hydrogen in type 1A spectra. Uh, at least for normal type 1 supernovae. These stars can be bright enough that you should see them if you have serendipitous pre-imaging. So for 2011, 2011 FE and a few others, we do have serendipitous pre-imaging. We can look for a source at the site where the supernova will go off, and we don't see any sources. So if it were a main sequence star or a red giant that was bright enough, then we should see them, and we don't see anything. You can go to an explosion after it has happened. Um, so you can go to a supernova remnant in the <coughs> galaxy in the, in the Milky Way and in the Magellanic Clouds and look for a companion that has survived and is still there after the explosion, and there's never been one seen. There's, there's been claims. Though. There's been claims, that's right. There's been claims, but they've been uh, maybe not 100% debunked, but significant doubt has been cast upon them. <laughs> claim, claim to the next companion. And as I mentioned, the rates, the predicted rates are off Schaefer? by Schaefer? So Schaefer's work actually is going against it, saying that there is no companion. But there was a claim by uh, Ruiz La Puente of a possible companion of the Tycho supernova remnants. People since then have said that she was wrong. But that, that's, I don't want to get into that uh, debate. Um, there are ways to save these. Okay, There is a way to save this scenario. Um, Grisan is not here, so uh, you know maybe I don't have to talk about it. Okay. <laughs> there are ways around it invoking a yield of momentum transport and the possibility that this uh, donor star um, evolves away from being a red giant and becomes a white dwarf while this white dwarf is trying to deal with this all this accreted material. So there's some sort of spin, uh, angular momentum transport time scale, and if that's very, very long, then before this thing explodes, maybe this star can evolve. But that's going to require a transport time scale that's many orders of magnitude what most people believe works. So I, I think there are big problems with that kind of saving you know, way out, which we can discuss offline because you've got to confuse the thing. Um, there is the possibility that these don't explode as type 1A supernovae, or uh, as regular type 1A supernovae. So Bob had a paper arguing that these should produce overluminous, uh, an overluminous subclass of type 1A supernovae, and in which case some of these constraints go away. We don't have a whole lot of observational uh, constraints for that subclass of 91T like type 1A supernovae. But the point of this talk is to motivate what the progenitors of the bulk of normal type 1A supernovae are. Um, Looking at the time, I assume this ends at 12. A few minutes for questions. Yeah. OK. Um, well, there is a very interesting possibility that this kind of scenario could lead to a different kind of supernova, a peculiar class of what are called type 1AX supernovae. Um, there are a lot of, uh, I'm trying to debate the time here. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about it very briefly. So there's this peculiar class, subclass, uh, sorry, I shouldn't even say subclass, a peculiar class of supernovae that appear in some ways similar to regular 1As, but also very different in other ways. So these are, are light curves of a, a range of them. But one of the interesting things is that they can get as bright as sort of the subluminous 1A class, but they also get extremely dim. So there's some that peak at you know, minus 14 and a half or something like that, very, very dim. Um, this is the Phillips relation you would get. The, this, again, this is the peak magnitude versus the decline rate. Normal 1As are here, uh, and these 1AX, this funny peculiar class of supernovae, is just all, it's all over the place. There is no significant correlation like there is for 1As. 
Even more interesting is what their spectra look like. So at relatively early times, the blue is the prototype 2002 CX of this funny subclass. Uh, they look relatively like regular 1As, which are shown here and here. Okay, but at late times, they differ markedly. Um, all this stuff is not noise, it's actually real, these are real lines. Uh, and the reason they look like that is because the line velocities, the vo velocities and, and the absorbing components are extremely low. So instead of thousands of kilometers a second, these velocities are more like hundreds of kilometers a second. These are also permitted lines. These are not forbidden, you know, optically thin nebular lines like you see in nebular type 1A spectra. Uh, there is still a photosphere at 300 days in these supernovae. Okay, so that's extremely interesting. Also, very nicely, there is a serendipitous pre-imaging detection of a source at the site of one of these 1AX supernovae. So there's an HR diagram in uh, Hubble, Hubble colors. Um, this is the detection, okay, and it's consistent with, uh, among other things, a helium burning star, a core helium burning star. So the scenario that has evolved to, well, one of the scenarios, the one I like best, that has evolved to explain this peculiar class of supernovae, is one in which you have a white dwarf that's accreting from a helium burning, a core helium burning star at such a rate that you can grow the white dwarf up to the change of sacrum mass. Okay, so I mentioned that for the regular single degenerate scenario, there's this issue with burning hydrogen into helium and then helium into carbon. Here we've circumvented, or they've circumvented that hydrogen burning phase, they're directly accreting helium. So that way you don't have that issue. Uh, it's easier to imagine growing this white dwarf up to the change of sacrum mass, igniting a deflagration, uh, igniting infection and then a deflagration. The other interesting, the other thing that has to be tweaked is that the deflagration is not allowed to turn into a detonation. Okay, so in this explanation for the scenario, you only have the deflagration, it never transitions into that supersonic flame. As a result, you only burn part of the white dwarf. Right? There's only this deflagration bubble that bursts out and becomes a supernova ejecta. Right? So there's a lower ejecta mass, there's a lower nickel mass, that's why they can be dimmer. The other part, the corollary, is that the white dwarf that's not burned stays there. Right? So you only eject the part that burned, you can keep, say, one solar mass worth of white dwarf just still there. And that's important because that means there's still a gravitational uh, source, right? There's still a gravitational potential that traps some of the supernova ejecta. So you eject some of the ejecta, but you keep some of the ejecta. And that persistent uh, you know, uh, ejecta that's still near the site of the white dwarf is what leads to that photosphere. So that's why there's still a photosphere in 300 days in this scenario. It's because some of the material is bound. All right, so maybe in the subclass of, of single degenerate scenarios, it actually explains very nicely these 1AX supernovae. Not 1A supernovae, but instead this peculiar class. It actually matches all these features. Um, you expect a C shock interaction because of this star is here, right? And one case which Orr mentioned in this funny subclass of type 1AX supernovae that was actually detected. Um, you expect to see helium if you strip off some of this helium from the companion and a couple of supernovae of this class. We do see evidence of helium. There is a source seen before the explosion. Uh, you also might expect to see the source after the explosion, right? The donor should still be there. There are reasons why it's hard to make that measurement, but perhaps in the next few years we can actually say that we or do or do not see a companion. Uh, the rates actually also ma end up matching. So we don't have to match the 1A rate, you have to match the 1AX rate. And that peaks for young stellar populations at a rate that's roughly right. So a lot of things actually work very, very nicely for this peculiar subclass being explained by this the variant of the single degenerate scenario. So Ken, it's not just the X companion that you can see, but you can actually see the thing that exploded itself. Yes. For yeah. So that's the reason why it's hard to say whether or not you see a companion is because that photosphere is still there, even at you know years after the explosion. So you have to disentangle the two. It seems this scenario is very common that when you have common envelope phase, the hydrogen layer expands, but you eject all the hydrogen, mm -hmm. leaving behind a helium core. That's right. It seems very generic when you have battery interactions. Yeah, that's why, why that's why. Why more common. I mean, these actually turn out to be actually fairly common. There's okay. something like 20-ish um, percent of the 1A rate. Okay. So, you know, as common as you think 1As are, um, this is only a factor of a few less common than 1As. So it's actually fairly common in young stellar populations. Uh, they're just hard to find. They're dimmer than 1As, and so it hasn't been until the past, you know, until the 2000s when they started discovering these. So what, what would the, the white dwarf look like? It's got a helium on, uh, envelope and a CO core. Is this like a, basically like a 
giant helium star? Um, so it's not helium because the he so the helium is transferred on. Yeah, oh, it burns into carbon and oxygen. So it's like a carbon. Uh, not sure. quite. So then that deflagration starts at the center, yeah. and that's burning to nickel and iron group elements. And so the stuff that gets ejected is nickel and iron group elements, but the stuff that's bound is also nickel. It's just supernova ejecta. So this will be a white dwarf with uh, radioactive material iron group elements on top. Okay. Um, and I'm probably going to run out of time, but I can actually talk a bit about that as well. Okay. For the bulk, though, the bulk of regular type 1A supernovae, this scenario has a lot of issues. Um, as I mentioned, maybe it's good for the 1AX class, but it doesn't appear to work out for regular type 1A supernovae. Okay, so what was the other scenario that most people talked about in, up until the year 2010 or so? It was a double white dwarf system that merged and formed an object that underwent a very similar explosion mechanism to the single degenerate scenario. What I mean by that is, okay, here's a cartoon uh, showing how you get a double white dwarf system, a double, double common envelope. That double white dwarf system emits gravitational radiation, comes closer and closer together. Um, that's actually going to be the dominant noise source, noise or signal source for space-based gravitational wave detectors is these galactic double white dwarf binaries. Um, so I'm looking forward to the year when Lisa or you, Lisa, whatever it's called, is launched. Um, so the basic idea is these two things come together. One starts to overflow its Roche lobe. Okay, you form an object that's larger than the Chandrasekhar mass, and you ignite convection in the core. That core convection becomes a deflagration, detonation, etc. However, life is never that easy. Even from the first years that this in the scenario was envisioned, it was realized that you have a big issue. The issue is that when you actually take that white dwarf that gets tidally disrupted and you try to put it on the other white dwarf, you don't just get core convection. Instead, you ignite, you tend to ignite a nuclear burning in a shell. And while that might seem not like not seem like a big difference, uh, it turns out to be a big difference. You get a relatively quiescent stellar evolutionary phase as opposed to the birth of a deflagration. Uh, in recent years, we amended the story a little bit. Um, in the interest of time, I apologize. I will just say in words what happens, okay? The idea um, that we came up with, that I think is physically grounded, is that you tidally disrupt the less massive white dwarf into some sort of rotating envelope that surrounds the more massive white dwarf. Because there's no time for cooling, you can't get the photons out of this optically thick material, okay? You don't actually form an accretion disk. Instead, you just keep this rapidly rotating envelope until viscous stresses or MRI or you know, some way to transport any momentum, uh, transports any momentum, shears out the differential rotation and turns it into a spherically support, uh, thermally pressure supported object. Okay, so you take the angular momentum, you shear it out, and you form a spherical hot envelope, which then evolves as a Kelvin Helmholtz uh, on a Kelvin Helmholtz cooling time. So as opposed to accretion from a disk, instead it's more like cooling of a Kelvin, Kelvin Helmholtz cooling of a hot envelope. So when we worked on this um, five years ago, we were quite excited because this is a different sort of scenario than what they were thinking about in the 80s. Maybe we can salvage this scenario and turn it into a 1A. Uh, unfortunately, as it turns out, it actually leads to a very, very similar outcome. So there's a plot showing the temperature density profiles of one of these merger remnants as it Kelvin Helmholtz cools. And as the Kelvin Helmholtz cools, this is the hot envelope. The base of that hot envelope stays hot and gets squeezed until it reaches this condition where carbon burning takes over. So invariably in this scenario, um, you get carbon shell burning and nothing happens in the core, or relatively little happens in the core. Okay. That shell burning leads to uh, an appearance as a carbon giant star, uh, which is not a 1A supernova. Eventually, other things will evolve, um, and you expect them to either collapse as electron, electron capture supernovae or core collapse supernovae, but no one thinks that they're going to lead to type 1A supernovae. Okay, so the problem with this scenario is that it doesn't seem like you're ever going to get a type 1A supernova out of it. Oh, sorry, can I, I didn't get how you get from rapid rotating thing to a spherical thing called that. Uh, yeah, that's because I, I, I blew go? past it, that's why. <laughs> why does it go? Where does it go? The angular momentum is transported to the outer region, so uh, you take you know, all this differential rotation and you just shear it out, and this material expands a bit. So it expands out to, say, 10 to the 11 centimeters or something, um, you know, out to like a solar radius from a white dwarf radius. So that's where the angular momentum goes, is into spreading the outer material. So the whole 
people think to rotate very fast? Uh, not really. So most of the momentum goes into the very outer layers, um, and the bulk of the material is uh, you know, essentially spherical. Um, we, can, we can also discuss that in the afternoon if you like, um, because it's somehow not budgeted time at all. Okay, so the main problem with this other standard scenario that people would invoke as an alternative is that it doesn't seem to explode, um, which is you know, too bad. Okay. Uh, it does meet <laughs> some nice things, right? There's no hydrogen in this kind of system. It's two carbon oxygen white dwarfs, and so you, you know, sort of trivially satisfy that. Uh, there is no companion that survives, okay, so that's fine as well. The rates turn out to work out nicely for double white dwarf systems, um, so that would be nice as well, but they don't seem to explode. And even if you were to wave your magic wand and say, I'm going to make this explode, uh, it's not clear that they don't violate some of these other observational constraints. In particular, because it's a carbon giant star, it's got a very large radius, right? It's not a companion out there, but it's its own envelope. So when the supernova ejector hits the envelope, you inject some extra shock energy, and you're going to end up with the same problems as for the single degenerate scenario. Um, also, before the explosion, there is no companion, it's just one merged object, but it's shining quite brightly, it's somewhere near the Eddington limit. And so that is also ruled out. Um, you're not seeing the companion, you would be seeing the carbon giant star itself, but that has been ruled out. Sorry, I thought the rates were off if you just count the number of white dwarf, white dwarf systems that we detect. Um, I can get into that in a few slides, okay. but no, that old. turns out to be good. Oh, okay, it's old information I have. Yeah, slightly old, but not very old. <laughs> okay. it's, it's, that's also been changing. Okay, so now I'm gonna move on to my favorite scenario in the last uh, quarter of an hour. And this is one where there are two detonations that take place, a helium detonation in a shell and a carbon detonation in the core. This is actually a relatively old scenario, so this was first thought of in the 80s, it fell out of favor in the 90s, and we're doing our best to resurrect it now in the 2010s. The basic idea is, uh, here's a helium shell around a carbon oxygen core, the helium detonation wraps around, and as it does so, it can trigger a carbon detonation. One way in which it can do so is if the shock wave that it's sending into the core converges into a point, and that convergence dumps a lot of shock energy into a small volume and can trigger carbon burning. Uh, oh, I have a movie. So here you see the helium shell detonation going around. Here's the inward um, shock wave, and that focuses in a small volume and dumps enough energy to light carbon burning. That's a converging shock um, double detonation scenario. There's another way you can do it, you uh, directly ignite carbon burning at the interface between the helium and the carbon. So as the helium is going around, maybe you're already able to send a carbon detonation wave in as well. Um, so there are uh, several ways you can transition from the helium detonation to the carbon detonation. In the early years, people discussed a certain kind of donor. Um, I'm not going to get into why I don't think that is the right way, but suffice to say, I do not think it is the right way. In more recent years, in the 2010s, um, uh, basically spurred on by work by James Gieshon when he was in graduate school, we realized that you can actually do this during the dynamical merger of two white dwarfs. So you have two white dwarfs, one of them, the donor, is helium rich, either it's a helium white dwarf, or if it's a low mass carbon oxygen white dwarf, say a 0.7 solar mass carbon oxygen white dwarf, actually has a helium layer on top. It has a, roughly a hundredth of a solar mass of helium on top. Okay, so that's a generic outcome of white dwarf evolution. You can merge the two, so you take a low mass carbon oxygen white dwarf and merge it with a one solar mass carbon oxygen white dwarf. The helium gets accreted, triggers a helium detonation that then turns into a carbon detonation. This is a SPH, or actually an Arepo simulation of this happening. Um, so this is the less massive donor white dwarf, this is the more massive accreting white dwarf. In this temperature uh, movie, you're seeing the generation of hot spots, so little spots where the temperatures get high. And as the accretion goes on, as the donor continues to accrete the donate material, the temperatures get higher and higher. So at some point, so at some point, the helium shell lights. Okay, so that's triggering the helium shell detonation in this simulation. This is a snapshot from James's work in 2010, um, allowing me to show you in a little more detail what's happening. So this is that helium-rich donor donating material through an accretion stream. And as that accretion stream interacts with the previously accreted material, the helium-rich material, you get the generation, the stochastic generation of hot spots. And those hot spots can then turn into a helium detonation. Okay, so you have the merger, or the, the lead up to the merger of a double white dwarf system, and you trigger a helium detonation that then triggers a carbon detonation. So 
in the interest of uh, clarity, I've tried to come up with a name for this scenario that has no missing parts. It is a dynamically driven, as in merger-induced, dynamically driven double white dwarf, double generate, double detonation scenario. Okay, so it doesn't roll out the tongue, but it uh, I hope gets the full message across and doesn't leave any room for any alliteration. Yes, that's right. It works hard on the alliteration. <laughs> Okay, so those are full star simulations. Well, what hydrogen in the equator? The hydrogen in the equator. Where the hydrogen is in the cold star? Yeah, so if this, for example, were a one solar mass uh, carbon oxygen white dwarf, the hydrogen layer is extremely small. But it could be there, right? And actually, that might help. Uh, it can help some of the nuclear reactions having those protons around. But you wouldn't expect to detect it because that, you know, the hydrogen shell is so small. But the donor must be pure helium. Uh, so it can be, say, a low mass, a 0.4 solar mass helium white dwarf, but it could also be a 0.7 solar mass carbon oxygen white dwarf. It's just that for those CO white dwarfs, you have the helium layer. But you can get a hydrogen nova before any of this goes on. Yes, you can. Um, yes, but I did not <laughs> talk about that because of time. <laughs> okay, so these are full star simulations. <coughs> Nuclear burning in hydro simulations is annoying because it takes place on light scales that are tiny compared to star uh, length scales. So while this might have happened in a full star simulation, uh, you shouldn't feel fully comfortable with it because it's all happening at a subgrid level. So for possibility arguments, what we wanted to do was make sure that these actually can happen, that the helium detonation can happen, and that the carbon detonation can happen. What we found after doing a sort of a zoom in simulation or zoom in analysis of one of these hotspots, uh, what we wanted to look at was how large of a hotspot do you need to get a helium detonation? Okay, is it plausible during the merger to actually have this happen? What we found is that the hotspot only needs to be a few kilometers in size. So these white dwarfs are roughly the size of the Earth. They're like a few thousand kilometers. So you can you know, sort of imagine that you can get hotspots that are a few kilometers in size. Right? That's not too much to ask. So it's at least plausible that you can uh, initiate a helium detonation during one of these mergers. One annoying thing we found from the study is that you can't use a regular nuclear network to do it. So regular nuclear networks and hydro simulations typically use a Prox 13 or a Prox 19 or some sort of shortcutted nuclear network that's designed for different situations. So they're designed for stellar evolution or they're designed for carbon burning. A helium burning is, is slightly different at these, uh, at the, you know, these detonation parameter, uh, parameter space. You need to put in a different set of reactions. Um, so this is ongoing work to try to figure out in these full star simulations to make sure that we're actually getting helium detonations when you put in the right nuclear network and you try to make sure you're resolving the nuclear reactions that are happening. But currently, I, I can say as of 2014 that this is at least plausible, that the helium detonation initiation during this merger is at least plausible. Um, and now we're going to be embarking on a collaboration uh, with James and Dean Townsley and Bob looking at uh, whether this is, you know, making sure that it, it is a possibility in these mergers. So that's the helium detonation. Can that helium detonation then trigger the carbon detonation? Again, similar story, carbon detonation length scales are tiny, you're not going to resolve them in a full star simulation. You have to go to the subgrid level and make sure you're at least uh, satisfying some sufficient conditions. And so we did this a few years ago, looking at the in uh, ingoing shock wave and making sure that it is actually able to ignite carbon detonation. What we found is that yes, uh, for you know, it's at least plausible you trigger a carbon detonation. It didn't have to be the case. Um, for example, when we tried with oxygen neon white dwarfs, it didn't work. So the oxygen neon detonation length scale is so long that even if we put in a ton of energy into a small volume, it didn't actually initiate an oxygen neon detonation. Okay, but for carbon detonations, it does work, um, at least in this toy model. Again, this is a part of an ongoing collaboration, making sure that in full star multi D simulations, you are still able to ignite carbon detonations from the helium detonation. Okay. But as of now, it's, you know, this, this whole scenario is still in its infancy, so we're taking the baby steps and making sure that right now it's, it's plausible. It's plausible to get these detonations. So, is it true that when you have multi, multi D, this uh, one D, I don't think, if you assume it's one D, then of course you have focus. Yes. But if you have a multi D situation, you have a detonation on the surface, a short wave. It's not good. That's for the country. Right. So it's not confined to the center. Uh, it's hard to right. see, but this is not a spherically imploding okay. shockwave. This is you know. You have this not is one D No. No. So this toy simulation was the, our setup was one D, right? Which is you know it's definitely an upper limit, right? That's why they're plausible, 
but it's not at all confirmed that it happens. So that's why we need to do the multi-view studies to make sure it still happens. Okay, so let's proceed under the assumption that these things do actually blow up. Let's say that the helium detonation happens and that triggers a carbon detonation. Okay, let's still go on and take the baby steps. What does this look like? All right, what happens if you blow up one of these dynamically driven double, de double, double degenerate double detonations? This uh, project that I'm wrapping up now is just doing the spherical, you know, the spherical cow uh, zeroth order approximation, taking a white dwarf on its own and just putting a detonation in it and seeing what you get out. Um, so there are some questions about nucleosynthesis that we uh, address in that work. What I wanted to highlight is what happens when you take that explosion, pass it through a radio transfer calculation, uh, in this case Sedona by uh, Dan Kaysen and collaborators, to see what it looks like. So this is the Phillips relation we get out. Right. In, uh, in gray points are the observations. Again, this is peak magnitude versus decline rate. And the colored points are different white dwarf masses and different initial compositions. And the first thing to take away is that very nicely. So um, the companion mass doesn't matter? That's right. So we're doing a total zeroth order. There's no companion. Okay. There's no There's helium shell. Helium. Helium. There's not even a helium shell. Okay. It's just the carbon oxygen white dwarf putting the detonation in the center. Serial symmetry. So it's extremely, you know, it's the baseline calculation. So even with those assumptions, it still gets the trend right. So that's actually very nice. I mean, if you remember the single degenerate um, Phillips relation I showed you know, a bunch of slides ago, they also got a trend-ish, but there was a whole bunch of you know, dispersion. I would say that we get at least as good as they did. Okay? And this is the spherical cow approximation, right? This is like, there are no knobs except for the white dwarf mass here. So we have not tried to refine the model at all. Um, this is just the first stab at it. And that first stab, I think, did pretty well. Now, there are discrepancies, right? The slope is a little steeper, so the, our most massive white dwarf explosion evolved too rapidly. You know, for a given luminosity, it evolved too rapidly. But, you know, it's a few tenths of a magnitude 15 days after the explosion. I don't think that's cause for alarm. Um, hopefully, when we do a more complicated, you know, more physical explosion model, maybe then, hopefully, they go, the discrepancies go away and don't get worse. So that's one thing to take away. The other thing to take away is that um, this is the subluminous class of 91 BG like type 1A supernovae. Our, mo our least massive white dwarf cases that we have here, this 0.8 solar mass white dwarf, when it exploded, only produced a luminosity that was something like minus 16. Okay, so we don't seem to see those in nature, which is okay. I mean, we, there should be a cutoff in the white dwarf mass that you can detonate. If you go to a very low mass white dwarf, the densities are so low that you, they don't really support a carbon detonation. <coughs> so you don't expect to blow up very low mass white dwarfs. There should be a cutoff. This is arguing that the cutoff would be somewhere between 0.8 and 0.9. Now there's some nuances in how we did the explosion models where I actually think these should be brighter than they are. I think they should go this way. But in any case, maybe the cutoff is at 0.8 or like 0.75 or something like that. But it's okay. There should be some cutoff in the white dwarf mass. Um, these models in reality might actually be up here, but you know, more or less, we're doing that okay. So the slope is okay, it's not perfect, um, but maybe multi-D simulations will do better there. So moving on to the spectra, uh, in green, again, are the models we have, going from 0.8 solar masses to 1.1 solar masses. In gray, this is a subluminous 1A, a regular 1A, and an overluminous 1A. Okay. Overall, I would say we did pretty well, surprisingly well. Um, the line ratios, I think, are pretty good, right? We get these strong silicon features, strong calcium features. The ratios are decent. The iron group element line ratios are decent. Uh, we even reproduce this interesting titanium trough that's between 4 and 4, 4,500 angstroms. We reproduce that in our low mass white dwarfs. Okay, so that's interesting. But there are discrepancies, um, somewhat related to this kind of evolutionary discrepancy. The velocities aren't quite right, so the velocities have a mismatch of a few, you know, a couple thousand kilometers a second. Um, but again, I think overall we did pretty well for this zeroth order calculation. Hopefully, the future will do a little bit better. Casey, I know that some of um, Casey's models, the uh, the colors were off. Like the D minus the color would be too red compared to the observed by That's two tenths. Do you have the same? I have exactly that issue. Exactly. So if it is something in the rate of transfer. Um, that could actually get rid of this discrepancy entirely. So that, yeah, that's exactly the problem. Um, so this gets to the question about rates that was raised uh, a few minutes ago. So these are the population synthesis rates for double white dwarf systems interacting 
in a slightly different scenario. So in these populations of these calculations, they're assuming that you need the two white dwarfs to add up to 1.4 solar masses, to add up to the change of sacro mass. In this double detonation scenario, we don't care about the change of sacro mass, right? That, that means nothing to us. So removing that constraint will actually bump these uh, population synthesis predictions up a bit. And I can easily imagine they fit with the observations. I mean, as is, it's actually okay-ish. It's down by a factor of a few. With that additional bump, I think we're easily within that range. Get into the question of observed rates. So double white dwarfs are hard to observe. White dwarfs are faint, and you know it's hard to observe both white dwarfs to make sure it's an actual double white dwarf system. Um, the best estimate so far is a paper that came out this year, uh, suggesting that the rate is something like seven times the 1A rate. So this is the rate of all double white dwarf systems that start to interact with each other. Okay, so if one seventh of those lead to 1As, then we're okay. You don't care about the mass, total mass. Right, I mean, I do care in the sense Most that of I, this double white dwarf, they have low mass, total mass. Much that's much. right. So that's why six sevenths of them might not lead to 1As. So, so the, the previous uh, discrepancy that I understood was for things that have total mass greater than 1.4 and would merge in a Hubble time. Right, and so, so now you're sort of loosening both of those, or one of those constraints. Yeah, so the one point, uh, okay, so there was a paper, I think two years ago, arguing that the super, you know, above 1.4 um, was, I think, 10% of the 1A rate or something like that. That number on its own has already gone up, so the super Chandrasekhar mass rate has gone up. In addition, if you allow for sub Chandrasekhar mass things, that continues to go up. Okay, so I, um, I guess we can end here. So this is the summary of you know, my belief system, the heavily biased belief system <laughs> of uh, what the situation is right now with type 1A supernova progenitors. So this standard scenario has so many problems, I find it hard to be able to get around all of them and produce the bulk of normal type 1A supernovae from this scenario. The age-old double white dwarf, long-lived merger remnant kind of scenario also has very big issues with exploding them. Um, I find it hard to imagine getting around those. This, this, this scenario, which I've been working on now for, I'd say, five-ish years, I think is our best bet. Um, it definitely needs more study. It's still relatively young. We need more study to make sure these detonations actually happen, and then to make sure that the predicted radio transfer, you know, the predicted observables actually match our 1As, but I think it's extremely promising. Um, it gets rid of all these issues uh, quite nicely, quite easily, actually, and so I think that's our best bet. Um, I do have more slides, but I should stop, I guess, for my <laughs> driven from Nashua, so uh, I guess I'll stop there. Thank you. Question for Ken. Um, I was late, so I apologize. So if you already mentioned this, uh, I'll just talk to you after, after you later. But what about the idea that I thought this was also very much in vogue of direct collisions due to three-body interactions? Did you mention that? Uh, I mentioned it in passing to okay. say that I didn't think it worked. Okay. Um, so just because of the, the details of getting the stellar evolution to work and still having the, the, the third body. Exactly. So. Yeah. So there are issues with getting them. There's also issues if you were to say magically that we have enough of those systems, when you collide two white dwarfs, it definitely picks out an axis of symmetry, right? So these things should have quite high degrees of polarization, uh, which is just not measured. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, well, <clears throat> roughly, what would be the time elapsed between the helium and the carbon detonation? Um, under a second, I think. Okay, yeah, yeah. I was wondering if uh, they could be distinguished. No, 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 no. Unfortunately. Um, I, I can't figure this out for myself. But so the cell population scheme seems to work. But in particular, there's this long-standing phenomenon that you see one A. <coughs> in post harvest galaxies, and of course in spiral galaxies. So it is related to star formation somehow, you know, younger population. So how, do, how does this uh, scenario uh, fit in with that? Right, so wh whatever your progenitor scenario is, it had better produce, be able to produce things starting around uh, a few hundred mega years. So that's the earliest we see type 1As. And we get, you know, at least in population synthesis, you get the void or systems starting at least by then. So if you take an eight solar mass star, it falls off the main sequence well within the time frame, and that gives you a white dwarf that's roughly 1.1 or something solar masses. So you start getting massive white dwarfs um, easily by that by that point. Okay. Any more? Okay. Yeah. Um, can we go back to slide number two? It was a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> that's a
That's impossible. Yeah. How dare you? <laughs> oh, uh oh. I'm trying to predict yeah. what the mistake so, is. So, Bob Gershon's idea, I feel like I have to point out that the Pearl Motor Pit was 99. Oh, I see, I see, I see. Very good. Yeah. Yeah, maybe the last time I gave this talk, it was in front of a LBL crowd, so I had yeah. to. <laughs> That's important. <laughs> yeah, and he's just here today, so. <laughs> I just deleted it entirely. Oh, I don't know about that. Oh, oh wait, this is being recorded. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> I will take that under advisement, Casey. Thank you. <laughs> so, so I'll ask a, one more question. So the, the helium is not being included currently in the newest calculation that you did, but my understanding was is that that can change the spectrum quite significantly, and especially in the low mass end, you'll have a lot of helium that you're burning. Is there any uh, advance in sort of the understanding of what that will do to the spectrum? Yeah. So the reason that this one of these varieties of the double detonation model fell out of favor in the 90s was this realization if you have a fat helium shell, when you burn that helium shell, you produce a bunch of ion group elements on the outside of the supernova, and that messes the light curve and colors up. Um, the, one of the outcomes of the 2014 paper that we worked on is that you can get these detonations in much smaller helium shells. And even on the low mass case where you create a decent helium shell, when that helium burns, it doesn't burn to iron group elements, it burns to silicon and calcium. And having those on the outside of the supernova is just fine. So it's not it's gonna it's not gonna uh, cause problems with the light curve. Maybe just a quick thing on that. Yes. In the mechanism when you talk about double detonation, you don't care about total mass. It doesn't matter. I, I, it's about from band. Yeah, well I, I do in the sense that I you know, I don't want a 0.6 solar mass primary. But you besides don't that, the total mass, one solar mass is fine. Yeah, so one, I mean, that tends to mean that the companion is probably 0 0.4, 0 0.5 solar masses, so you end up with a super change of state car total mass anyway. So you still need a super change of state car, okay. That's no, 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 no. It, it's, it's just the outcome if you have a one solar mass primary, then the companion, if it's 0 0.5 solar masses, that's 1.5. But you don't need to be above the change of state car mass to get the explosion. And the requirement that the binary is stable, a stably increased. So, for example, you could do with a 0 0.9 plus a 0.4, and that's 1.3 total slow mass, so that would still explode. Okay. Uh, so, Ken will be here for the rest of the day and early tomorrow morning. Uh, there's no other events to plug your time, so please uh, approach <laughs> Ken if you want to uh, meet with him uh, during this visit. And let's thank you, Ken again. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm just meeting with you too, besides that. Yeah, thank you. So, sorry, yeah, so the idea that there's two channels, well, I mean, obviously, long channels, is that, is that idea now sure. No, people definitely still really keep going. There are definitely people that still coming to motivate this way. No, with a shirt. Okay, yeah, I mean, I probably have to do this. So, what he's got is I think that's possible still. That's, there is something about the uh, younger one A's look different than the older one A's. I would say maybe it's due to the younger one A's.